Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. I'm very excited for today's conversation with Hani Rashwan, who is a co-founder and CEO of 21 Shares, a company you very likely already know. But he's got a fantastic set of entrepreneurial experiences all across fintech, and we're going to learn a ton today. So with that, Hani, let me welcome you to the conversation. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. No, my pleasure. You have such an interesting and varied background across fintech, and I'm always interested in the journey that people take towards the thing that they are doing now. Can you tell me a little bit about your early entrepreneurial experiences and how you got started? Sure. So I actually, I started first realizing that there's a big audience you can reach. There are products and users that, that you can release and have some rapid iteration when I was fairly young. I think I was 11 or 12 when I started messing around with computer languages and, and databases and, and websites and the like. And the way I initially started actually was I would be playing all of these various games, RuneScape, World of Warcraft, Neopets, depending on, on what age I was. And I would start creating fan sites, guides, walkthroughs, et cetera, for the various games that, that I would be playing. And that ended up morphing into something that was, by the time I was 13 or 14, pretty large. That's, that's amazing. I have to ask, how many hours did you spend in RuneScape? A lot. I think getting to level 99, chopping down yew trees <laughs> is, is quite the ordeal. Yeah. That's, that's probably the core lesson about persistence comes from massively multiplayer online video games, for sure. A hundred percent. I think RuneScape specifically was probably the thing that I spent the most time on. I was pretty obsessed with Neopets uh, around when I was nine or 10, I think. And I mean, look, doing these websites is actually what, what taught me programming. And so it's, it's immensely valuable. At some point you want to create a monster or characters database, and then you start learning about SQL and MySQL and PHP and how to put all of this on a website. And then it, uh, it tends to escalate from there. I think by the time I was 14, there were about 750,000 monthly users that would visit these various websites that I would do. And, and the games were quite varied. And then I, I, I had volunteers from around the world because at this point, no one was making money here. And, and, and we had have volunteers from around the world helping these hundreds of thousands of users across everything from RuneScape to MapleStory to Neopets to PowerPets and, and, and a whole slew of other things, experience a better game, understand and uh, how their pet would look under a different paintbrush before buying the paintbrush and all, and all sort of fun things there. There was a point, obviously, where it started costing a lot of money for a 13 or 14-year-old to, to justify the server costs to his parents. And um, at that point, we started discovering advertisements and learning a lot more about that and, and running and optimizing ads on, on our websites in, initially just to fund it. But then I think that is one of the first things that, that taught me and showed me the reach of the internet and also its, its potential. That's pretty amazing. And it's also amazing these days to think what it would be like to to have that passion, but in a world where, you know, Axie Infinity has $1.5 billion locked into a market making contract in order to, to breed uh, this generation's version of Neopets. But after that foundational DNA, how did you get into starting to build companies, you know, with Kout and, and Ribbon and other companies like that? Yeah, so I I sort of always knew that I would want to move to San Francisco and, and be part of Silicon Valley and, and build companies this way. And I wasn't sure about the right opportunity. It's funny saying this now because I've, I've been in fintech for all my career, but it wouldn't have been the most obvious thing that I would have guessed I would have uh, gone into. And it initially started by meeting someone in, in a program that was working on a company called Kout. Kout being the last four letters of checkout is, is, is what that was. And that was the initial thing. I think that company start to finish was maybe six... Uh, or seven months. It was a very, very quick lesson on on 
how not to build a company in so many ways. We had co-founder issues, product issues, distribution issues, code issues, but it forced me to move to San Francisco very, very young. I think I was 20 then and just immerse myself in that world, which then after that company unfortunately failed uh, and we parted ways, I, I channeled some of my thoughts and experience at the time into Ribbon which Ribbon and Payout are actually th the same company. We initially started doing something on a more consumer version, but we started competing against very large products with sizable advertising budgets and the like with Square Cash at some point in Venmo earlier. And so we pivoted that company into a more enterprise API set of, of products. And that's what ended up becoming payout and, and what ended up being a successful sale for us. The, the I mean, these are not easy industries to get into, right? I mean, figuring out payment processing and e-commerce and going into fintech, and this is fairly technical kind of, how do I put it? There, there's just a lot of industry knowledge around it. And it seemed that you ramped straight into being a creator of the software. What was that experience like? You know, how did you surround yourself with the, the sort of industry knowledge and so on to make these types of companies work? I mean, I think at the very beginning, we weren't thinking about it like that. My co-founder at the time with Kout was, was building Kout, which was a, a one-page checkout for digital downloads. And so think about if you're just selling one PDF guide to something, rather than use PayPal, why don't you just have a beautiful one page with a credit card box there? And so he was the first user of that product. And in a lot of cases, even what we're doing now with crypto with 21 shares, I initially built this because my family was looking to invest and we couldn't find such a product. And so I think a lot of it is finding things in my life or in that case, in my co-founder's life, where we would have wanted this product to exist it didn't. We looked for it. We couldn't find it. And therefore, we invented it. And then little by little, you learn. And it's, it sounds bizarre, but I, I remember, I remember one, of the, one of my first memories with Kaut is asking, uh, at the time, the Stripe founders and the founding team, what a chargeback was. Like That's how new we were. And, and we were going to start doing millions of dollars in credit card processing. And so little by little, you, you gain expertise. And if you've stayed in the same sector like I have with fintech, over time, hopefully that has a compounding effect and you can grow faster. Absolutely. So there's nothing better than uh, trial by fire. So these are pretty tech forward solutions, therefore, for digital commerce. And then thereafter, you make a transition to, to digital assets and crypto. Can you talk a little bit about how this came on your radar and I, I guess what catalyzed you to go from this as a tool for my personal use to it being a more generalizable company. Sure. So my story with crypto is actually qu quite interesting because in, in some ways it took a really, really long time. Given how immersed I am in the space now, it really did take a long time for me to get it. So for, for both Kaut and Ribbon, the primary investor, the first check-in was this famous venture capitalist called Tim Draper. And if you read anything about him, he is a contrarian, out-of-the-box thinker who is from the very, very beginning of the movement a very large Bitcoin bull. And so that's how I was introduced to it. And I was introduced to Bitcoin back in 2011 and 2012. I remember getting $50 worth of Bitcoin from another entrepreneur in his portfolio that was working on it at the time. And the $50 worth of Bitcoin were three Bitcoins. And so they were each between 15 and 16 bucks. And, and that's how early it was. I dismissed it. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I still worked in payments. I understood some of the pain points there. But at the time, it wasn't super obvious. We thought that it could be an interesting index of the black market or something like that, or maybe a tool for completely failed states. But it wasn't until the end of 2016, for me personally, when I'm Egyptian, I grew up there, I was raised there, my family is there, and Egypt's not an insignificant place. It's a, it's the 21st largest economy in the world by by PPP. It's a real diversified place, even, even if we have challenges and problems. And we had a currency devaluation in Egypt that caused a lot of people to risk arrest to convert their life savings into crypto. And there were a bunch of cases where, where doctors or engineers would be arrested for using local bitcoins and, and things like that. And when you think about it, the currency devaluation devalued the currency by 50%. And so overnight, you lose half of your net worth. 
add on inflation of 35% annually at the time. And that was a very, very difficult year. And I remember thinking that, okay, if this is relevant for a country like Egypt, then it's probably equally relevant for countries like India and Turkey, Brazil and Russia. And really, Italy and Spain have had immense monetary issues, immense uh, economic issues. And that's when I understood the potential of crypto and understood that I was completely wrong about the scale. This is actually potentially much, much larger than I initially thought. And we were funny enough in the process of selling payout at the time. And so I was just doing the M&A cycle. And so I, I wasn't looking to start another company, wasn't thinking about it. And all I was trying to do is now that I knew that Bitcoin or felt that Bitcoin and then later Ethereum would, would revolutionize the world, I thought they were wonderful investment opportunities and my family should make a meaningful investment in that space. And so all I tried to do at the end of the day is get my family to make a meaningful investment through an ETF. We then scoured the globe, saw a lot of very, very imperfect products, some dangerous ones. And it, I remember it took me six or seven months to help my family make an allocation that we felt comfortable about, that we felt safe about. And obviously throughout this entire process, I I saw some of the internal issues with this side of, of the industry. My co-founder and a very close friend at the time, Ophelia, was experiencing something similar with her family. And at, at the beginning, this was just an intellectual exercise of why are the Winklevoss twins only focusing on doing this in the United States when it's clear it will move faster elsewhere? Uh, and then you can use that base to expand everywhere, in, including the United States. And, and why don't we just build the right structure in a, in a place that is appropriate for it, that will benefit from Bitcoin, and then again, use that base from which to expand. And that's the story of, of basically how we listed the world's first physically backed crypto ETP at the end of 2018, uh, despite not being from the ETF industry, not knowing a single thing about it, and just learning from from the very beginning on, on virtually every concept in the space. It's fascinating progress. And sometimes you just have to break through some of these conventions and, and and you can only do that by taking a very fresh look. I want to meditate on something you said a little bit ago before really kind of opening up 21 shares, which I think is just, it's, it's a an, it's an really interesting observation. And I think something we all have to figure out, which is that, you know, you were in payments, you were probably thinking a lot about alternative investments based on sort of the situation you've described and asset allocation and so on. And in being exposed to Bitcoin and exposed to maybe more broadly just these these really frontier type technologies, there's this pushback that I think we all experience and dismiss. And as as things have become more popular and more well known, I'm trying to put a finger on this feeling that people have, you know, on on this reaction. Even the sort of the smartest investors and asset allocators are very sort of tilted towards orthodoxy in, in a lot of cases in finance. And I wonder if you have any thoughts or ideas about like why you had this reaction and then in your interactions with folks across the the investments ecosystem and so on i'm sure you come across a ton of skepticism are you able to pull apart that feeling of skepticism a little bit like where does it come from and and how do we diagnose it i can try i think that it's not that people are so wedded to orthodoxy regardless of who you are whether you're you're investing $10,000 or $100 million, you have a scarcity with what you're able to put your money into. And if you look at frontier technologies, there's there's a lot of them. And, and sometimes things can be hiding in plain sight that maybe in retrospect will seem obvious, but at the time would be a challenge. And obviously, you know, you are rewarded for how early and how prescient you may be. But I do not think it was obvious to a lot of people at the time. Think about it this way. We're in the crypto space. And obviously, th this summer, this year has been very, very good for NFTs and for NFT gaming. We are starting to see some very interesting things around storage, which for me, and, and, and I'm sure you as well, these are things that we've known about for years and years, right? And so why, why did we not think about investing in, in storage and, and going all in on that? two years ago, when maybe it's the next trend after NFTs. NFTs have been around forever. We could have easily picked up a punk for a fraction of the price even just a year ago, let alone a couple years ago. And so I think it is a matter of 
you have a limited set of options of where to allocate your time and your resources. And you can't do everything. And there are some cases where by investing in uh, CryptoPunks, maybe three years ago, two years ago, you would have been unable to invest in, say, Ethereum or Bitcoin to the detriment of your, probably at the in the short term, your, your portfolio. And so I think there's a lot of those kinds of dynamics that end up happening. Now, obviously, there are some investors who have very different investment goals. And so we, we tend to meet a lot of people on the asset management side that are seeking to beat inflation or seeking more wealth preservation than wealth expansion. Uh, and there's all of those kinds of dynamics. But I think there are many, many VCs, many investors who think on the long term, who think about big, bold bets, who tend to miss a trend or two, or in most cases are just a little bit more late to it than, than others. We've seen that with VCs around crypto, where some were super early and really into it. A lot of folks, very smart funds, just didn't didn't see it, didn't believe it, and are now making up for it. But you know, boy, did it take them some time to get here. Yeah, and it, it's expensive to to catch up, but I guess that's just part of the market structure. Okay. So, sorry. Um, I also think that we're talking about this where it would have gone supremely well for you, right? Clearly, if we had all invested in crypto earlier, we would be happier people. But there are a lot of cases where people were equally bullish about other frontier technologies and the timing was off. And so it can go the other way. And I understand part of the fear there. Kleiner got into a lot of trouble for investing in clean energy before it, it was a great investment opportunity. And, and certainly Tesla now and, and over the past few years has been great. But there was a timing issue where when Kleiner was doing it in, in the mid 2000s, maybe that was too early. Nuclear fusion, which is a very, very exciting technology that's getting a lot of money now, was not obvious and was a bad bet financially for decades. Even as, as, as early as maybe 10 years ago, that would have been a great way of losing your money. And so I think the flip side is there as well. Overall, it is better to be late than not to show up at all. And especially with crypto, I think it is such a paradigm shift that it's fine that it took people a while. And the important thing is, is getting there eventually rather than not getting there at all. Totally hear you. And I think you know, I often think about efficient markets as um, as a random walk. And in the case of some of these frontier technologies, you, you don't see the time dimension, but the the sort of the time dimension is really important because you can be right, but but wrong on on 40 years, right, with artificial intelligence and machine learning not being something that you could implement until really 2012. And so many things in, in the system have to go right for it. And the same thing for Tesla and a number of other themes that you've mentioned, ESG, you know, the cultural change around it and so on. So I ab absolutely hear you on. And obviously, I mean, we can trace the, the history of crypto itself back to the 90s. This is not the first time that we tried to do this. Absolutely. Okay, so let's switch then to 21 shares. Can you give us a couple of headline numbers just in terms of kind of what are the products? What's the AUM? Sure. Um, what's the shape of the company? Absolutely. So we are the world's largest issuer globally of crypto exchange traded products. We listed the world's first physically backed uh, ETP, which basically means that for every dollar that goes into the ETPs, we are forced to go and buy a dollar worth of the underlying cryptocurrencies and store it for you. So everything that is there in terms of a market cap uh, is not just the market deciding, but rather physically backed in the background with the actual assets. And that was a revolutionary concept when we launched it. At this point, I think we have over 20 products in four currencies, uh, euros, dollars, pounds, and Swiss francs. We're listed on the national stock exchanges of Germany, Austria, France, Holland, and, and soon a few others, both in Europe and outside Europe. And we have by far the most expensive product suite. And so we have normal Bitcoin and Ethereum ETP. But as as it tends to happen in crypto, once you buy Bitcoin and Ethereum, you go down the rabbit hole and you want to buy a lot more assets and you want to think about the possibilities a little bit more. And we're unique in that we can go down that rabbit hole with you. And so we listed the world's uh, first Solana ETP, Cardano, Polkadot, Tezos, Binance Coin. And in some cases, you get to learn about uh, staking, for example, well, we have the world's only staking ETPs, our Solana and Tezos products stake and return those uh, rewards to the end user minus our staking fee. And 
If you want to go and diversify into an index, we have that. We have the world's largest selection of crypto indices. And so the idea that we have is we want to make crypto as easy as possible to invest in. We want to make it more accessible and we want to build bridges from the traditional world into the crypto world so that we can enable all of these investors who may not be technically savvy or in the case of a lot of fund managers may actually require for this to be a listed security or you know in a format where their regulations allow them to invest in this from the from the very beginning and that's basically what what we package by far the most expensive product suite in the world we are the biggest issuer globally both in terms of products but as well as AUM and the AUM now is a a little bit over $3 billion. And I think the company is about two and a half or three years old. Fantastic. I want to ask about the types of clients you're targeting. And, you know, for trying to prevent myself from getting down the sort of Bitcoin futures ETF question immediately, I think before we get there, I wanted to ask about like, who is buying these products? You know, who are they for? And, you know, how are they using them? And then, where are they accessing them, right? Because I think we, we've got a global audience. They're going to be familiar with the American ETFs and sort of that market structure. But how, how does one access an ETP? Who is it for? And how does that fit into the the investment management flow? So I, I can't comment directly on anything America related, which it, it does help that the company today is 99.9999% outside of America. All of our products are listed primarily in Europe. Our customers are European. We get global customers, but certainly our, our marketing efforts are all outside of the Americas. I think in terms of the type of clientele, it's it's quite varied. On one hand, you have a lot of institutional investors, fund managers and the like, who are more comfortable with something that resembles how they invest in other assets. If you think about commodities, which which crypto is the closest to, in, in my opinion, like gold or something a little bit more problematic to store like uranium, investors tend to want to invest in ETFs or securities that, that track this, where you're not buying the barrels of petroleum, you're not buying the gold and storing it and having to worry about the theft and the insurance and the caretaking and all of that. You're just trying to make a macro bet on the underlying asset, there, whether that is the oil price or gold or uranium or, or what have you. And if anything, you could argue that crypto is a more complex, more difficult, more complicated faster moving than any of these commodities for which there exist very popular ETFs. And so for a lot of the institutional guys, this is where this ends up being immensely useful is it opens up their ability to do this in a, in a format that their investment committees and their compliance and their risk feel comfortable with. And then from a regulatory perspective, oftentimes, this is the only way they can invest in such a class. You, you, you can't easily put something on a flash drive and then somehow pass through your same audits and things like that. So we see a lot of those kinds of clientele, whether that be fund managers or private banks or family offices or the like, we haven't seen in the space too many large institutional investors. You still haven't seen too many pensions or insurance companies get into the space, but they will follow a similar, I think, path where certainly these kinds of vehicles are going to make it easier for them to invest in the space. In addition to that, we have a wealth of retail clients. Every one of our products is, is retail priced. We care about giving institutional grade quality products to retail users. And we end up seeing a lot of either non-technical users who may not feel as comfortable holding this in a wallet or an exchange with all the hacking risks and the technical know-how and expertise that, that would make them more comfortable doing that. And that's fine. We would rather people be in crypto than not at all. And then in some jurisdictions, it actually may be advantageous from a tax planning perspective to hold these in ETF form or ETP form rather than physically. And so we see a, a whole slew of, of different kinds of users. Really interesting. And I think you know we talked about the friction of skepticism and attention and salience before. And in, in some way, the AUM flows, the money flows that go into exchange traded products touching crypto assets to me are a, a really special signal because they show interest in this asset class but in a very traditional venue 
right? So you, you've got ways to access the asset class in lots of venues, and the people who are the RuneScape website builders of 2021 are doing, in large part, doing a lot of this themselves, whereas for folks who are looking at portfolios or just don't have the time for it or don't don't want to go down into another rabbit hole for a number of reasons you know accessing it through a traditional vehicle is a really high signal piece of information because you know it's the, it's the adoption into the mainstream so like the rate of change through this channel is almost showing you the the conversion of the most skeptical audience and and how that's going and we we think about it in, in an even greater context because you have to realize we ourselves are very crypto native right we're we're a third of the company are engineers uh, we've been there from the very beginning. We invest in all sorts of different projects ourselves. And it, it's a lot more about getting as many people into the space as possible. And then as time goes on, obviously, some of this dynamic will change. And we're perfectly cognizant of that and, and quite accepting of it. We have a sister company under our same parent called Amoon, where we do tokens. It's quite early. We released our first products within, I think, the last couple of months. But we sort of liken this to the, the, the distinction between Blockbuster and Netflix DVD by mail versus Netflix streaming. It's obvious that tokens are going to be a huge part of the future and wallets will get better and better and more people will be onboarded in wallets. It's just not very clear when the, a billion people will be on wallets versus what we're seeing now. And if you were building Netflix, you probably saw, and, and, and if you look at their internal memos, uh, around the time that YouTube launched and things like that, clearly streaming is, you know, th they're intelligent people. Clearly streaming is, is a core part of the future, but maybe it's not there quite yet. And so for us, it's all about building bridges into the crypto asset class. For some people, the best vehicle for that at the current time is an ETF. For others, it's tokens. And for many, I think it will be an ETF today and a token tomorrow. And we're hoping to build a product suite where we can end-to-end -end help those customers both get into crypto as well as expand within crypto to become more advanced and more comfortable with it. And so we really like seeing this as a full stack end-to-end -end experience that we're building over time. That's fantastic. And, uh, and it makes a lot of sense. I want to ask around the market structure of launching an ETP, and I think you're, you said you're on the Deutsche Börse. Can you just describe a little bit what all that stuff is? Like, what what is a Bourse? What what makes a Deutsche? You know, but generally speaking, like, what's the what's going on there? Like, what's an exchange? Where do things clear or settle? What does it mean to physically hold something? Why is it an ETP versus not an, an ETF? Like, can you fill out a little bit of the detail around how the nuts and bolts of this product are put together using the the pieces that are in play in in European capital markets? Sure. So I think the most important distinction is actually between physically backed versus not physically backed. I don't think there's enough benefit from really thinking about ETFs versus ETNs versus ETCs when the real distinction is physically backed versus not. You also start to realize the, the more you look into the space that, for example, a Bitcoin ETF in Europe is an impossible endeavor because in Europe, ETFs cannot be tracking only one single asset. It has to track an index. There's a diversity requirement where you have to have three or five different elements in there in order to call it an ETF. Otherwise, you cannot launch it. And so whereas in Canada or the US or Brazil, you can launch ETFs on just gold, you can't actually do that in Europe. So in Europe, gold is launched through ETPs, not through ETFs. But again, that's not the real distinction here. The real distinction is if I'm buying a $1,000 worth of this stock, Am I getting exposure to $1,000 worth of the underlying, say, Bitcoin, or am I getting indirect exposure to it? That's where something like futures come in. Futures are not physically backed Bitcoin. Futures are not buying Bitcoin and storing it and making sure that I have $1,000 worth of Bitcoin in the back, in custody, that, that is backing up the stock. The stock is the value of the 1,000 Bitcoins that are there. Futures are, are what's called an indirect exposure to the asset class versus getting something that is physically backed, which would be a very direct exposure to it. And I think that's what people should pay the most attention to. We have some products that are physically backed. That's what we would recommend because ultimately that's what people are really looking for. 
And then we have a whole slew of closed-ended trusts where the product might have significant deviations from the real asset value and the amount of crypto that is actually bought. And that's where you get products that have very significant premiums or discounts where you can buy you know, $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, you are buying it for $14,000 because of how that product is constructed. And so on a, on a physically backed product, that does not actually apply because for every dollar that is in the product, there's a dollar worth of crypto that is in the background in storage. And you can, in fact, actually, even with our products, you can give us the shares, allow us to KYC you, and then we will send physical Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever to a wallet. And so that, that explains that everything that we have is just fully backed one-to-one. -one. You asked a few basic questions at the beginning, and we can we can run through them. A bourse is just a term meaning stock exchange in other languages. Some languages use bourse or borsa instead of stock exchange. It is the same thing. These products need to trade somewhere so that you can go on a daily basis with your brokerage or bank account and be able to purchase them. Uh, the National German Stock Exchange uh, similar to the New York Stock Exchange, has a number of different securities that you can buy, including ETFs. Uh, and so Deutsche Börse is just what the Germans call their equivalent of the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Awesome. Thank you for that. Can you talk a little bit about the regulatory question? And I'm thinking about how to make the regulatory question you know, compelling and interesting, but it is that, well, let me start with a presumption. My presumption, I think, as is yours, is that a physically backed product is strictly better than a bunch of derivatives packed together into some sort of abstraction, which is meant to track a price based on a, a futures exchange. You know, it's just simpler to have the thing than to have a reflection of a reflection of a thing. And so without commenting on, of course, the, the American issue, I do want to pose this question of what's been your regulatory experience um, getting this product out and what are the regulatory counterparties like? Like what's their posture? What's their vibe? How are they talking about things? And how did that let you get into market so early relative to where we are in much of the rest of the world? Yeah. So with without, again, commenting specifically on, on the U.S., our philosophy at the company has always been to go through the front door. We're not looking to get a shortcut or go around regulators. That ends up meaning that we don't work in as many markets as we would like to, because we really require, philosophically at, at the firm, agreement with, with our regulators. The first thing that we did was we, we spoke with 27 different regulators around the world, and we collected all of their opinions and research before deciding that the Swiss regulators, in our opinion, were by far the most advanced, the most long-term thinking. And Switzerland as a country really does benefit from Bitcoin doing well. And, and they were cognizant of that and, and wanting to invest further in that. And so we wanted to have absolutely zero problems in our home jurisdiction. And that's how we landed in Switzerland. That then enabled us with intelligent regulations and and very long-term focused regulators in an environment where it's very clear that the composition of, of Switzerland and the economy and their GDP per capita and their, and their wealth, et cetera, does afford them the ability to, to take more risk and the ability, uh, frankly, to, to do different opportunities than, than may be available to a central bank or a financial regulatory authority in another country with, with different conditions. But again, we did our research and we realized that. And that was a big part of how we got there first. And frankly, how we are still outpacing every competition that has that has tried to launch to date. We have by far the most complicated products. I doubt that it's because others don't want to launch them. But it's probably a function of, for, for the more technically sophisticated things like staking and inability to launch them if you don't have a technical minded staff and, and composition of the company. And then on, on the other hand, if, if, you're in, if you're in jurisdictions with different regulations, then clearly you're not going to be able to launch some of these products as, as easily. And we certainly see that. Overall, in addition to the 27 different regulators that we first met with, we're probably speaking to half a dozen to a dozen quite actively at any given point in time, including now. And as you would imagine, they, much like the human race and our general population, are, are very diverse and varied in their 
opinions and in, in, in how they think about the industry. Overall, most regulators that I've met with, including a lot of the folks that may not have agreed with us or given us the green light, tend to be very focused on ultimately protecting the end customer. I think that is their primary motivation. They're not in this for money. They're not in this for other things. And while we may disagree on, on what is dangerous or what is good for the end customer in a lot of cases, that is the primary motivation that is consistent with regulators around the globe that we have interacted with. Super interesting. I want to take an adjacent question here. And I think this connects to your earlier point about Amun tokens and building into wallets and, and non-custodial solutions. And so the premise is that you've launched all these products and a number of them are quite technical and re require kind of crypto and functionality, whether it's you know staking or, or other forms of um, return generation. How do you think, and perhaps also in the broader context of the asset allocation that a family office would do, how do you think about risk given your journey from, you know, from start to finish in crypto? How do you think about taking on risk versus avoiding it, minimizing it, maximizing it? How do you think about the emerging types of risks in crypto assets? And how do you choose the risks that, that you prioritize taking? So generally speaking, we're a bit allergic to risk overall because a lot of our customers are, are trusting us with money that is very valuable to them. So we do not take any unnecessary risks. The kinds of products that we list go through a number of committees internally to, to verify not that we are recommending this product, but rather that this, there's a real team behind this. This is not a scam. They're going after something they believe in, and they've shown time and time again that they are following this path with, without too much deviation. And when you look at our product suite, I think we just launched the world's first Algorand product, Polygon ETP, um, as well as Avalanche ETP last week. We could have launched those much earlier. There's a reason we waited this long. And so we tend to launch products that are a little bit more mature. We tend to launch things that have a little bit more of a track record and less of a very exciting trend that you are seeing now. I think we talked about a number of trends on this very podcast where we do not have product, but I think we'll have products for them in the next three to six months. Um, and so we, we understand our user profile very well, and we want to ensure that we give them products that are more mature. Our ETPs are, are not going to be the brand new project that was launched a week ago or a month ago, even though in some cases we are allowed to list those. And that's just the, 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 the choice and the philosophy that, that we have at the firm. Absolutely. Makes sense. And I think as our products become more complicated and... I mean by that, as we seek to list more complex products, certainly being this careful with what we list, I think is going to be quite beneficial to us. And so an example of this, for example, is um, yield farming. Yield farming is an incredible thing that a lot of us in the industry uh, either know about or do or try to do on a, on a regular basis, but it's quite consuming. And then in terms of time, in terms of learning, there are ways to mitigate risk, but it's technically challenging in, in many ways. And this is the kind of thing that a family office would understand a yield farming as an ETF. A family office would understand dollar yield off of stable coins as an ETF or as a token, frankly, as well, right? But it's the kind of thing that at some point we will list these more complex strategies and doing it in a careful and well thought of manner is going to ultimately be beneficial, not just to us, but to our end customers as well. And so we seek to do a lot of these kinds of things, but the timing of it is something that we're very careful with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think the, the sort of the picture behind my question is a picture of alpha generation and in investable opportunities. The macroeconomic picture is so bizarre these days, and the performance of the various asset classes are so correlated and I think so confusing and strange in, in terms of their behavior, you know, it's sort of a big risk on brush that finding some sort of fundamental alpha generation and figuring out what are the things that people are doing that are valuable 
at a transformational scale for the economy, right? Where where somebody can put a, a large multi billion dollar investment check. I think those types of opportunities, of course, are risky, but you do get compensated, and they they don't have to be so early stage that you are speculating entirely. But they can be packaged up and accessed for the retail investor. The hard thing is, if it's easy to find, it's probably a little bit late already. And so, you know, I, th- I think the work that you're doing is providing these on ramps for people to get exposure to places of innovation, but to do so in in an environment they recognize. Exactly, and I think you'll end up maybe not getting the thirty or forty percent yields, right? That that maybe you can get with more risky yield farming and the like. Certainly not the triple digits and 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 beyond that that we sometimes see i don't think we'll ever really do something like that on the on the etp front but in terms of yield absolutely we internally and our research has written about this numerous times we think the first key feature of of the crypto asset class was non-sovereign apolitical gold and and that was a very key first feature we think the second feature of, of crypto has been yield in a rapidly inflating world where yield cannot be found easily and i think this is part of of what we we are seeing we have provided some yield historically in some of our product and i think every product that we have that stakes has had a tremendous amount of inflows as a result of that our solana product which unlike every other solana etp on the market is actually staking no one else stakes actually makes that product completely free. In fact, it is not just a free product. It's a product that pays you money. If we're charging 2.5% for it, but the yield is 6%, that tends to be a pretty good mix for, for the end user. And as a result, we've grown that product from 0 to $200 million in in a historic time. Amazing. How should our listeners learn more about you, about the company? Where should they go? We love Twitter. We love LinkedIn. We have beautiful websites. Go to 21shares.com, at 21shares on Twitter. Go to amun.com, that's A-M-U-N.com, at amun on Twitter. Me personally, I'm at Haney on Twitter, that's H-A-N-Y. It's been fantastic to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for sharing the story and uh, spreading the wisdom. Absolutely. Thank you so much again for having me. This was fun. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>